Hello, I'm going to describe some collaborative work that the School of Medicine has done with the Department of Drama in Queen's. It's about teaching medical students with tutorials which we've taken from the two-dimensional page to real life. And we've, I've done it with three colleagues in biomedical sciences and Paul Murphy, who's the head of drama in Queen's. To introduce the topic, I'll ask you what have these got in common? We've got the Lunar Excursion module from Apollo 16. We've got a beautiful rendition of the theatre, the father of physiology, born in 1813, and my favourite physiology textbook, Ganon's Review of Medical Physiology. So they've all got to do with simulation and thinking outside the box. If we look at the Lunar Excursion module, if you've been listening to your podcasts commemorating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing a few years ago, you'll have heard Charlie Duke talk about landing on the moon 2,000 times in a simulator before he got to do it in real life. And he joked that he crashed at least 1,000 of those 2,000 times. You could certainly argue that patient interaction with medical students is just as important as a moon landing, and certainly opportunities for simulation of patient interaction early in a medical student's career are few and far between. But where better to simulate being human than theatre, where that is the stock in trade of what it is? So looking at the earliest physiologist, Claude Bernard himself was a playwright. He went to make his fortune in Paris in 1834, having written a play, Arthur de Bretagne. It was a play in five acts. It didn't really do too well. The noted critic at the time suggested that Bernard take up something else. So drama's loss was physiology's gain. But having said that, some of the terms that Bernard used, such as milieu and terrier, owe themselves to the theatre. So his starting as an artist, as a dramatist, wasn't lost. It was beneficial to science. His thinking was influenced. So why not take advantage of this attitude, this non-silo thinking? Why should we be left out? There's some fabulous cases we use to teach medical students. They're very old. I, I learned using them. My lecturers learned, lecturers learned using them. And my students learn using these cases. So why not take them off the page and bring them into real life? So how did we enact this? Well, we all got acting lessons. I have to say it was among the most fun things I've done in my entire career, but also very challenging as well. I will say that. And we learned the Stanislavski system. Now, the Stanislavski system is a system whereby Stanislavski drew influences from psychology, yoga, body psychotherapy, science, and even management techniques to help actors simulate being humans in a way which was very convincing and very authentic. He focused on the golden triangle. So asking actors to get into their own emotional memory, try and remember what it was like to have had similar emotions to the people they were playing, using their imagination. What if they were like, what if, the magic if. And then also using the given circumstances, which are the backstory, the scenery, the costumes. In our case, we wanted to use acting students with a backstory of one of our physiology cases. And the physiology case used in this situation was the physiology of hypofertility. So in this tutorial case, medical students learn about the hormonal control of the female reproductive system by looking at a woman who's 34 who hasn't had a period for two or three months and she's very worried. So we had acting students come in and play the 34 year old woman. They used the physiology case as the given circumstance. So they, they trained in physiology themselves to a degree. They learned about what was going on for the woman and then they portrayed this woman for the medical students. There were two drama students per 22 medical students. And just in case the case didn't work out, I had experienced and charismatic physiology facilitators. So if something went wrong, they could step in, but it never happened. I was very, I was delighted to see that uh, this was never needed. After the session, we had a post-session debrief from the medical students to the drama students and vice versa as well. And everyone fed back in questionnaires, either by email or in person. The questionnaires were responded to about 80% of medical students participating returned questionnaires. 
Typically in this kind of research, I only see about 50%. So this was really enthusiastic. And they said that they felt the tutorials were challenging and, and engaging, authentic, even better than the real thing, better than their family placements or scripted OSCE observed clinical examinations, that they really contextualized the physiology and gave them a chance to practice empathy and communication, and that they were fun. The drama students themselves thought they were upskilling on acting in a very non-traditional way, which was exciting, that they really felt a sense of worth in training a new generation of clinicians. For our part, we and the staff thought we needed more drama students, but we thought the medical students were very clued in, very invested. And we saw that this gave medical students an opportunity to screw up, to make mistakes in communication in a way that wouldn't be harmful to a patient's mental health. So simulating it in a safe space. They said the wrong thing to a, a woman who was having difficulties with fertility, for example. We have some numbers as well. Scores here indicate an average in response to uh, agreement or disagreement with, uh, with, with a statement. So the closer to five these scores are, the more strongly they, the students agreed with, this, with the statement. So looking at the statements, students felt 4.1 out of 5 that it was an authentic experience of the clinical application of physiology testing their diagnostic, skill, diagnostic skills. 4.5 out of 5 agree that it gave them an opportunity to practice or demonstrate empathy, motivating them to know their physiology better. And they enjoyed the tutorial. 4.2 out of 5 average score for agreement with that statement. With the drama students, there was 100% drama students returned their questionnaire feedback forms. They weren't as enthusiastic about the authenticity because there were only two drama students for 22 medical students. So they didn't feel it was that authentic, but they did feel it tested their acting skills, that they were able to challenge the medical students in a useful way, enable them to become a better actor. And they really seemed to enjoy it a lot. And it was very apparent watching the tutorials that they really got into the characters that they were playing. The future is, we need to be more like Claude Bernard. This opens up new potential for interprofessional collaboration between scientists, clinicians, artists and dramatists. And in the C25 medical curriculum, it's a new integrated curriculum happen happening in Northern Ireland at the moment. And it's got an emphasis, emphasis on communication skills and learning in context using case-based learning. So further into the future, we have to learn to train doctors in drama and empathy. And at the moment, we're writing this up. We have a paper being written called The Hard Truth About Soft Skills. It's a great opportunity to mix up uh, drama and art in the hardcore scientific literature. So it's something that's very exciting at the moment. So I'll introduce you to the team, the biomedical scientists. Well, there's me, uh, Mary McGann, my colleague, Sharon Parkinson and Etain Tanzi. And from the... Department of Drama, we have Dr. Paul Murphy. Hello, everybody. My name is Celia Beecher Martins. Uh, I'm based at the uh, Department of English Studies at the School of Art, Arts and Humanities, Universidad de Lisboa. I'm also a researcher at Ulysses and a member of the Medical Humanities Project at uh, the University of Lisbon. I'm going to make a brief presentation on, on my poster, which is called Using Film to reduce anxiety, a case study with Portuguese high school students. Uh, as indicated in the poster, the, the case study presented was part of a larger finance project that aspired to, on the one hand, gain insight into how watching certain types of films could reduce the uh, viewer's anxiety levels, and on the other, develop reflective methods of working with film that would permit the extension of positive results beyond the viewing experience. Because of the limited time, I will not go into details about the study or the methodology used with Portuguese high school students, as all of this information is available on the poster. Suffice it to say that participants' anxiety levels were monitored throughout the experiments using Charles Spielberger's Stein inventories, which were calibrated with the Portuguese reality by Silva and Spielberger. Open answer self-reporting questionnaires with, question on, with questions on participants' connection to the film and also on how they felt after watching the film 
were used to, on the one hand, begin a reflective attitude in terms of the film viewed, and on the other to determine if participants were aware of alterations in anxiety levels demonstrated in the STI results. Uh, other reflective film analysis uh, tools were used, including pre-associative analysis when working with individuals or uh, smaller groups. In the general study, after watching one of the three films used, Cameron Crowe's Elizabethtown, Bas Armstrong's uh, Chocolate and Cameron Crowe's Say Anything, the reduction from trait anxiety level to state anxiety level after viewing was very substantial, with groups uh, uh, presenting average reductions from 8 to 20 points that um, on a scale that measures actively across 60 points. Moving on to the discussion of the, uh, of the outcomes of the case presented in the poster, I would like to make four points. First, the first is that the female group registered a reduction of nearly 20 points from, from Thai to Sai after the screening of Elizabethtown. And while their Thai was higher than the Portuguese average there, uh, for their age group, the Sai after was considerably lower. As an aside, it is also to be noted that one of the volunteers, A3, was excluded from this statistical analysis because her side before score at 70 and her side after score, score at 32 would have upset the overall results. A3 naturally wrote that she felt better after watching Elizabethtown, commenting that uh, reflecting on the film had allowed her to put situations in her own life into perspective. The second point I want to highlight is that while the tie to Sai after results were generally constant with all of the films used, Elizabethtown was the film where participants' open answer self-reporting questionnaires indicated that they felt better or more hopeful after watching the film, not just because they relaxed during the screening, but because the film helped them to gain new or different perspectives. The film is apparently lighthearted because of its humour and uplifting musical score, but it deals with all the major issues that teenagers face, failure, betrayal, death, grieving, false, false identities. In a plotline, it starts with an ending and ends with a beginning. This type of plotline and, and approach seems to be significant for, teen, for teens, as A3's response was not unusual. Third, A4's response illustrated the importance of encouraging serious students to embrace connections with lighter artistic objects especially as these senior, serious, uh, well-behaved adolescents often pass under the radar. Still, they may benefit from or even require to learn reflective skills to help deal with the anxieties of growing up with their performance-driven instincts, and film could provide a medium for this. Finally, extending reflect uh, reflection on connections with film beyond the viewing experience appears to have positive outcomes. A3 spoke about how hovering over Howell's moving castle using pre-associative film analysis techniques showed her the advantages of accepting herself. I end this presentation acknowledging that the reduced number of participants mean that this means that this work indicates possibilities, not quantitative results. Still, it may speak to possible future lines of inquiry and suggest that there are benefits to encouraging effective contact with film during the vulnerable, vulnerable age of adolescence. Hello, I'm Prof. Yorisa Kamach, PhD candidate at the University of Oviedo in Spain. The biggest driver in my PhD work applying young adult sports fiction in the context of mental health is that, paraphrasing the famous feminist quote, the personal is academic. Like many other teenagers, um, when going through that, difficult developmental stage of my life. I struggled with my sense of self and my self-image concept. Like many others, I got through. But in my case, reflecting about all the time lost in those battles with myself years after, I did notice what had helped me the most, reading young adult fiction. Now, it is one thing to believe in the power of literature to heal that as ancient a belief as civilization itself. The Egyptians um, already thought that to be the case. And the empirical evidence to support this case was a different matter. 
and also a complex one. I wondered where were the methods, any method to study that. When I started my PhD thesis three years ago, I was blocked by that obstacle. So I said to myself, okay, I'm going to enroll in the psychology degree as part of my investigation because I'm still sufficiently convinced of the worth of the idea that I'm not the only one whose sense of teenagehood is supported by reading. Three years later, um, I have not only learned um, about the very interdisciplinary nature of domains like cognitive literary studies, experimental bibliotherapy, or rather persuasion in health. I have mixed them together to conduct a fiction reading experiment um, which I gave participants two young adult sports novels to read and learn to love their selves and bodies better. I would like to believe uh, um, about the idea that we must be fooled that teenagers in search of thinness and beauty are being shallow creatures. Eating disorders like anorexia put that message through clearly enough with doctors and entire families around the world. Anorexia is the deadliest mental health illness. And as I have learned through the very also transdisciplinary perspective of gender studies, it especially endangers those whose sense of gender identity goes by stereotypical beliefs. In my experiment, I gave 65 participants, um, very young participants, um, Miranda Kinelli's novels, Breathe, Annie, Breathe, and Coming Up for Air, which are very contemporary examples of uh, sports women set in the United States who love their bodies. Um, and I gave them, at least to the experimental group, together with feminist reading guides meant to empower their eating, exercise, and perception habits um, out of the trap of gender stereotypes. And it worked. The tests I conducted, um, what I have learned uh, from doing psychology, were not lying. Those young people had seen their vulnerabilities reduced. But I also captured during the interviews they took part in that same idea. And it made me very happy. Um, because I may be studying psychology, but I never forget, and now I know for sure, that the power of narratives will express a sense of actual healing experiences is a thing. Hello, my name is Sarah Ahmed, and I'm here to talk to you today about my paper, Indeterminate Grief, Liminality and Magical Realism in Young Adult Literature. Grief is a challenging range of emotions to experience, even as an emotionally mature adult. To encounter grief as an adolescent is even more complex, as one has to juggle the trials of emotional and physical development with the alien experience of loss. In this paper, I interrogated the experiences of the protagonists in a selection of YA novels, Skellig by David Almond, A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, City of the Beasts by Isabel Allend, and Wing Jones by Catherine Weber, in order to explore how adolescents encounter and respond to grief in general, indeterminate grief in particular. By extrapolating from the characters in these YA magical realist books, I hope to better understand the experiences of young adults in the real world. A note first on indeterminate grief. 
Indeterminate grief is a concept I extrapolated from Rando's theory of anticipatory grief. Grief is the range of ex emotions usually experienced after a family member dies. In anticipatory grief, Rando describes a complex range of emotions felt for someone who will be lost in the near future. It is the act of mourning before the act of death itself. For me, indeterminate grief is a hinterland of uncertainty experienced by either a patient or their kin in instances of a severe illness with an unclear prognosis. It is the grief felt in the liminal space when one isn't sure if they should yet grieve. My research used the overarching lens of liminality to explore my questions. The formative years of adolescence can be read as a constructed liminal space, suspended between the polarities of childhood innocence and adult experience. Young people use this time to develop physically, emotionally and sexually, to construct their identities and to lay the foundations for future life choices. They are as liminal as the time and space they occupy. Magical realism and YA literature are both traditionally dissident genres, ultimately concerned with representing vital truths through the acts of questioning and subversion. They are also both inherently liminal in their focus and place in the overall literary canon. Combined, they create a space well suited to exploring taboo topics such as grief, including elements of the fantastic, using magical realist techniques allows for a certain distance to be achieved between the very realist questions traditionally examined in YA novels, allowing for a more reflective examination. I use these concepts of liminality to explore the previously mentioned books and drew out a number of themes. Firstly was the use of magical realism to create guardians for our protagonists. Think of the characters of Skellig and Wings Dragon and Lioness. These guardians are guide to the hinterland of both grief and adolescence. They are as liminal as the space they help traverse. They can be read in many ways. They are manifestations of the colonialized system of thought, which magical realist elements draw upon in that particular novel. They can also be seen as plays on various mythic and fairy tale tropes. They are obviously not real, in inverted commas, not in the general sense. Perhaps they are psychological projections of internal grief, extensions of the fantastical thinking of childhood, complex metaphors, or perhaps they are truly, simply magical. The protagonists themselves are also magical and liminal beyond their adolescence. In the tribal rites Turner examined whilst developing his theories on liminality, he identified not only the initiation ritual as liminal, but the initiate themselves. Turner described neophytes who are symbolically and physically stripped of their worldly possessions, broken down in order to be built back up again. In sometimes being disguised as monsters, these neophytes are highlighted as other in line with our magical guardians. They are broken down by their indeterminate grief to a tabula rasa. However, although our protagonists begin by passively enduring their grief, they find their own agency whilst traversing this liminal space and truly embody the role of hero. Magical realism is used to encourage our protagonists to see the world differently and then to rebuild themselves with their often enhanced ideas about the world and their own nature. They undergo a psychological and chronological journey worthy of Joseph Campbell. The liminal spaces and states in these novels can ultimately be seen as healing. To enter such a state is to emphasize emotion, to question norms, to explore the self and how the self fits into a wider global context. These states and spaces offer our protagonists a phenomenological safe refuge where emotions can be explored and transformation can occur. Healing occurs formatively, but also through metaphor and through exploration. And so to conclude, why a magical realism can offer insightful and engaging ways of approaching common and difficult issues, providing examples and templates for readers and a lens through which academics can better understand the adolescent mind. Our young people are smart. They know that monsters and magic do not exist. In times of difficulty, they know that fallen angels or lionesses are not going to appear to offer guidance and comfort. In cases of indeterminate grief, magical realism and liminality are not going to provide a cure. And even for our protagonists, they are not remedial. However, they can be restorative. 
The novels considered and many more besides provide examples of how difficult periods can be traversed. They raise and discuss important ethical and moral questions. They encourage the use and acknowledgement of different perspectives. They inspire readers to explore their emotions and then to embrace them. They provide hope that difficult times can be survived.